Okay, my name is Elsie Clown Slides Off. I come from the Lakota the band to the the call Sands Art band. I come from that that band of Indians. My my grandfather and my grandmothers were from that band of Indian they were they were the ones that were in the Custer battle and from then uh, they were taken to they went from after that battle they went from there to Canada and they stayed up there till the US government went after them and brought them back in a boat to Fort Yates and then they were brought back to honor trees where they were made to live there around that place for a while until they were given land. So my grandparents lived there for a while and then when they were given land, they moved to where they were, where the land was, which is about 40 miles from here towards north. And then this um, community that I lived in is called Thunder Butte, and that's where my grandfathers lived there. Their lands were there, around there too, so I grew up around there. My parents, my mother was from Cherry Creek, and when I was very young, I stayed with my grandmother and grandfather in Cherokee, Mr. those are my mother's parents. Can you tell their names? Uh, their names are um, John and Molly did not go home. Their Indian name is Gleshni. And I stayed with them when I was up to six years old, I stayed with them because I wasn't in school then. And I see how my grandfathers and grandmothers live at the time. We had to go to Cherry Creek. That was called a substation, one of the main places where the Indians go to get their food, or ration, they call it. We go in a wagon. We camp there overnight, and they get their food. It's just like getting commodities, but only the, the, these are staple foods like rice, beans, raisins, fruits like prunes, and bacon, and coffee and sugar that were given to them in small bags. But it's something that they need, so they go after it every month. We go in a wagon, we camp there, and then we come back again. So every month we go, we go down there. You know, the wagon trail, I was down there a little while, not too long ago. The wagon trails are still there, but they don't use them anymore. I see where we always camp. I remember those places where we always camp. And the places are still there, but no one lives around there anymore. And then after I was six years old, we moved back down to Thunder Butte, where I went to school the first year in, in Thunder Butte Day School. That's another community where that's one of the main communities, too. Cherry Creek and Thunder Butte were main ones, and Whitehorse was one of them. And those were the main, um, they call them substations. So that's where an agent lives there, and it's, he's like a 
they called him Boss Farmer too, which, you know, he he acts like um, he's the boss of all the people there. And at the same time, he does some police work too. He has to see that everything is going good, but how the people are and when everyone, somebody needs help, he helps them. And at that time, that was, that was, we were still under the Bureau of Indian Affairs. There was no tribal councils then. So we had to do everything under the BIA. And the schools was under the BIA and we, we were taken care of by the BIA to go to school, they gave us clothes, money to buy clothes, and sometimes they issued clothes to us. And that's how we got into the schools. I was went to school in Thunder Butte for one year, and time was hard. There was no job, so my, my father said to me that if I can go to, to the boarding school, that was my first year, or well, the second year, he said it would be a big help to him because he said there's no jobs and and at the time we didn't have a home. He said he was going to build a log house for us to live in so that next year I could go to school in Thunder Butte again, which he did, but I didn't go to school there. I still went back to boarding school. And my, 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 I had other sisters that went to school. And I stayed with my other grandparents in Thunder Butte. My, those are my father's parents. My father, um, what is their name? my father, my grandfather's name was Amos and Julia Clown. They, They had an older son, was older than my father. He was killed in World War Two, World War One. In that war in Germany, he was killed in Germany. And all those years, those early years, it was a very hard time for them because in Indian way they. They really um, took it hard, and every year was a memorial. They do things in memory of him, and every year he was brought back from Germany to be buried, and he was buried in my on my grandmother's land in where they lived. So um, they do memorial things. Can you describe what different kinds of things they did to honor him? Well, they they put up their teepee. They have a great big teepee, so they put that up. And then they invite all the people. The people know that they do that, so they all go down there and camp around there. And, and in the evenings, the day before, they start coming in. And at the time, same time, they get ready for for the food that will be served to the people. And and in the evening, they, all the old men, old men from, from wherever they come from, gather in that teepee. And they would call me, my grandfather calls me, and he's, he's, he tells me to take water to them. And I would take some water in a pail and give water to each one of them old men. Those were some of the very old men that were in um, the Custer battle. And they were, some of them were chief there at that time. But um, they don't, they don't, they bring in their, their war bonnets and their staff and whatever they have. And they smoke the pipe, they, they pass it around. They'll be all sitting around inside that teepee and I would give them water and then they would smoke their pipe 
and they began to tell how what all they went through in that battle and how, how it happened, where where they were when at the time that happened. I used to listen to them because I sat at the door and I would listen to their talk. And they even tell me to sit and listen as well. I, I listened to it pretty good and I remember a lot of it, but as time goes on, I couldn't remember some of them stories, but it's a very sad situation at the time, I guess. No one knows what happened, so. Uh, kids, people killed, uh, and then um, the next day when that time time comes for the decoration, we all go to that cemetery, and and they do it in an Indian way. They sing the Lakota memorial songs, and they'll pray with the pipe and. And then the, the white people from Dupree, that's a, they call them legions, and they come and they they honor him by shooting their, their gun, saluting the, and they put their flower on, on his grave and they go home, they leave. And after they leave, the people all go back down to where my grandma and grandfather live, and that's where they, Serve the meal for everybody. Everybody gets to eat. All the people that were there, and then afterwards they they sing their memorial songs and whatever they have giveaways and and they do their honoring. All the ones that come there, they honor him, and that's done every year. Since 1935, my grandmother died, so that, that was the end of that. And then, so that's how I got to know my grandparents real good, and I hear them tell, I, I ask them, you know, how did you do this a long time ago? How do you cook your meals? Or, and how do you keep your babies? And, you know, I just like to find out things, you know, because uh, just curiosity, maybe. What do you use for pampers or diapers? I said, <laughs> and just ask them. You know, they tell me, and they even showed me how it's done. But those are some of the very old things. And but um, it's really different. Nowadays, nobody ever sees them or know of them, but... And then after, after that, I was in, sent to boarding school. And then, then, that, around that time, we lived in Chair Creek. That's a, that's one of the main places in, down that way. And we lived there and it's, I got to know all those people down there, my mother's relatives, and she... There, I didn't hardly talk to any of the old people, but I see them. I see how they dress and how they live and how what they eat. I remember the old people, all they could prepare, the, how they prepare their food was mostly everything's dried dried and then cooked, cooked real good. Even meat, any kind of meat just dried, you cook it and then dry it. And um, the um, fruits are dried. And everything that they can keep is dried, like, and they dig, dig this wild turnip. They make long braids of those turnips, and that's the food. Which is about the food, also about the the wild turnips that they dried in long braids. Mm -hmm. They do that, and then they drive meat, any kind of meat that they get a hold of. If they have any leftovers, they dry them. And that's to keep they can keep that a long time, or else they pound them into what they call 
pemmiken det kom vasna en en där kan keep a long time so the, I know the older people all the women always be sitting there and pounding away on the, the meat when it's dry then it, you can pound it like that and, and you can get it all soft and fluffy like and they mix that with um cherries dried cherries and um a little grease from a towel of that you melt that and then you mix it with it and that's how you keep it and uh, it can keep a long time so it can carry it around as you go around they go by they, you eat that and that's how they live they don't have potatoes they don't have well they do have that ration food that they get every month but it's hardly but it's not always used because they don't they they live their Indian life so they ha don't hardly know what these other foods are they don't know how to cook them but as time goes on they learn to it takes time for them to learn but it, they like it after they learn it they like rice especially the older people I know that and then they had to go um, long ways to town to face to do pre in the wagon sometimes it takes a day or two to get to town and same way to get back we camp on the way we get there to go about and getting our food from town traveling days in, hor in wagon and horses driving in hot days sometimes sometimes it rains but still we have to go in a wagon that's where I learned to handle horses to hitch up the team to a wagon and those horses were so gentle that you they don't move for you. They just stand still so you can put the harness on. Get going back of them, but they don't kick or nothing. They're really trained with horses. And while doing that, my grandfather told us that way before, way before when they first, probably when they first moved back to, into the reservation, they were given ox teams, and so those ox teams were used by the Indians, but they have to learn a certain word for those ox when they go someplace. Like they learn how to, those those team, ox teams, they know the words, so you got to learn those words to make them go and stop. Like they say, G to go, and the other words I couldn't remember now. But anyway, uh, I guess at one time they were going, and um, these ox team probably wanted water, and they were going by a dam of water. So they just turned and ran for that water, and they, they used all those words on them, but it wouldn't stop. They just went into that water with that whole wagon. <laughs> and so it, was a, it was nice, but... That's the way, I don't know how they got them out of there, what happened, but they just, they wouldn't tell me, but they laughed and it must be funny. <laughs> but that's what I guess they used to, they give them, they give them tools and things to farm with and they had to learn all that and to drive those ox teams. Those were way before, before, um, Probably in uh, this was in back of the 1920s that I'm talking about. In 19, that's when we had to ride the wagon to get ration food and go to town. And this one about the ox team was way before that time. That's when they were first brought back to the reservation. The women folks 
always wore long dresses. And whatever cloth they can get hold of, they made their under, own underclothes. No fancy things, just plain. Their dresses are made all in one piece with sleeve cut like this. And sometimes they wear um, just a leather for belt, a hide, belt made from a hide and their moccasins. And they wear those leggings. A woman is not to show their legs. That's one of the main things about a woman. No man cannot see a woman's leg. They're embarrassed when they do that. They cannot do that. It's one of the respects that they, that, that's why they wear long dresses. I saw them when they were, even my grandmother, they wore long dresses up to their ankles every day. And their dresses, I made, I sewed dresses for my grandmother. Sometimes she takes about five yards just for the skirt part here. But it just, you know, it, it depends on how much cloth you have and what you can afford. Sometimes it's more and sometimes less, but that's what, uh, that's the way they're dressed. But men folks, you know, the, the time when I knew my grandfather's they were still wearing those breech cloths. They don't wear. They wear pants, but then they still wear those breech cloths that they were a long time ago. But as time goes on, they go away with their underclothes like that and began to wear the white man's underclothes. But they wear the pants, they wear the shirt. But the hair cut is, it's, it's, the hair is always long. The only time they cut their hair is when they're mourning, when um, one of the family members dies. That's when they cut their hair. My grandfather was there at that Custer battle, but he said he was 12 years old. And my, that time, my grandmother and grandfather, were, they weren't married, but um, they were in that. They were with their parents, so they were in that, their parents were in that fight, so I guess at the time they were, they stayed home when they, when these other, when these men were getting ready to be on that war path or whatever. So they stayed home with their mothers and they said they were digging these turnips on the hillside when this the attack came. So uh, they ran and and I guess they hide wherever they can to get away from all that shooting gun. And, and my grandfather said that he saw one man. He was, he was riding a, a horse that was all paint. He spotted, he was riding that and he said, when those white men came and sat, we were still up on the hill, and, and so this rider w went towards them, in front of them, and he made a turn in front of them like that. And for some reason, they didn't shoot him. So he made a turn right in front of them and came back, and after that, they all started shooting at each other and came and fought them, and that's when they all got killed. And that, that day that I heard them talking, that man was sitting in there, he said that was the man that went, was, was the one that rode that spotted horse and he went before those, all those army or soldiers, whatever you call them. And, but they didn't shoot him, so he didn't get killed. And he was there at the time when, um, when um, my grandfathers were having that memorial things for my uncle. He was there, and he was he was in our community till he died. What was his name? His name was Spotted Eagle. Chief Spotted Eagle was his name, and all of us, all of us that lived there, know him. What was his life like? What? 
I don't know, I just, I don't know exactly just how it, but he, you know, we, he comes and stay with us and he'll go to another family and stay with them. But he didn't have no, I didn't see his wife. Maybe he lost his wife or something. But he was, he lived among us just like any other. But we, everybody liked him. He was a good grandpa. So that, we all know him. And after that, my grandfather said they came back this way and they camped on this side of right under that, where that Fort Meade is now. They camped there along the river. And they, they were planning to stay there. <clears throat> they lived there for a while when a bunch of soldiers came and they told them to get away from there because the, that Black Hills was theirs and told them to move. And so a lot of them were against it, but she said they had to move or they would have been killed, so they had to move out of there. And he said that was, and they, I guess it re did really hurt them, you know, to make them move when they thought that it was part of their land, but they made them move out of there. <clears throat> so he said they had to move out of there. And then he, that, that's when they moved back this way, he said. It must not be a good life then because they had to move every, be scared every night. And, Did they go to Canada then after that? That was after, well, that was after they were brought back from Canada. Mm -hmm. Because they went shortly after the war was over, the Custer battle was over, they, were, they went from there to Canada and then they were brought back and then, then they moved back again that way. That was right about that time. Well, they moved all the time, so I don't know which, which is first and which was when, but um, that was part of the, I got the paper, he wrote a statement on that, so I have the paper too, if I can show it to you if I have it ready with me, but I didn't know you was coming, so I didn't get it out, but I have to look for it. That's a copy of that, it's in a state um, historical thing in Pierre. That's where I got, they gave me that copy from there. And were there any other stories about the battle and afterwards that you might remember them talking about? No, I heard it, but I can't remember. It just, it's been so long ago. Just what is written down, that's what I can only remember, but, mm -hmm. but I, I can I have that one written down and it's in that. Pure State Historical Society building there in Pure. That's where that paper is, so they gave me a copy. That was not too long ago, and I, I have that copy to show. It was it was printed in a, in a history book, Zebra County history book. Mm -hmm. I wish I remembered all the stories that I hear. Some of them are hard to believe, but it, I guess it's so. But it kind of, my memory's not that good, so. Did you talk about the spirituality of the people and their Indian religion? Well, um, one thing I know that is they were, the government banned the use of the Indian religion on reservations and all over, I guess. So it really wasn't used, this area. There were medicine men, but they don't. You can go to them and for medicine men and treatment, but they don't, they don't do it like they do now. They're, they're using it more now than, than back then because they were banned. They, they use it, they get punished. We're not supposed to use it, so my grandfather never, they only told us what to do to be, to take care of ourselves. 
what a woman should do to take care of herself from harming others and in time of the, when they have their period, how to take care of herself. Those were told to us girls. As we grow up, we have to know it. If we don't tell, they don't tell us. They have no respect. So we have to learn that. I was told, uh, that was the first thing I was told, how to take care of myself and, and how I should be towards the others because that's important for a woman to know, especially when you have kids. I was, so when, when I first got this woman sickness, I had to go through a ceremony. They, they boiled sage and after it cooled off, they used that water to, they bathed me with it and that's supposed to um, cleanse you. And do you, they do that when you're done too, when it's over. And they make you live four days in the tent by yourself. You cannot go visit around because of one being sick. You, you cannot go near a sick person because you can make that sick person die if you, if you have your period in. And, and visit when they they might be taking Indian medicine, and that's dangerous. So we cannot go to visit anybody at the time, and that's very strict. That's very strict, and and you cannot go in front of men. You cannot jump over clothes, kids' clothes. You have to really watch yourself, and that's been that's been told to all to us girls. The first thing you have, they, that's what they really make us know those things. Nowadays they don't do that, so they, that's why nothing is good now. But those are really, the Indians are really strict about that because of the medicine man and the, and the power that the medicine man has. And through that power, all these things are controlled by them. And we have to know, and we have to live by it. And the men have to know about it. Men cannot. One thing that is done right now, is really happening right now, is girls going out, having babies without being married, having kids without fathering. And that's one of the main things that the Indians do not do that a long time ago. That's one of the biggest shames that anybody can do to themselves. When one does that, is not considered a, a right person. And that kid that is born fatherless will be known as, I wouldn't know how to say that, but they, they, they kind of resemble them to dogs, you know. How the female dog goes around, and all the male dogs go around, and then the male dog, female has their dog puppies, and then they, short while they leave them and go, and that's the way they are considered to be. So when one, when a woman does that, it's really strict. They, they say it right out to him that he should never do it again. And the men are supposed to know that that's their child living like that. And when that child grows up, if it's a man, he cannot be a leader or a chief or nothing. Same way with a woman. She cannot be anything. It's a, she live in a shameful world, I guess. She's considered a not born right, or, but all that is, don't go by those anymore, so this is how we are now. All the, you read loud, all the girls have babies without father. And then they don't take care of them. 
That's that's the way we are considered. I guess if we do that, we're like dogs, female dogs, and that's that. So that's what they. It's it's a kind of a shameful thing to say, but nowadays nobody. Even you say, even if you say it, they won't, won't listen. They won't. They won't believe it. But that's one of the values I think. I think that the Indians go by is to live right. We have five values to go by. One is the bravery and individual freedom, which is right, or to know the right and wrong, to live with nature, and there's two more. I can't remember the two more. My memory is not good anymore, so I can't remember. Would you like to talk about bravery? Bravery? What I tell the students is, Long time ago, the Indian men are brave enough to go out to hunt that big buffalo. Sometimes they are on foot. They don't have nothing to ride, but they go out hunting those mean buffalo. And sometimes they get killed, but they're brave enough to go hunt them. And that's how they get their food. So I tell my students that they're brave enough to go through the school they accomplished, accomplished something for themselves. Be brave enough to finish school. I guess they earn a feather when they when they do accomplish something. So I think that's about the best thing. Huh? And then, would you like to talk about uh, knowing right and wrong, the individual freedom? Individual freedom is when, well, that means this. This means that what you do in your life, what you do is right. What you should know, what you're doing is right. What you're doing, if you're doing wrong, that you should know what you're doing and straighten yourself out. But that, that's what the main thing is about. It. If one uh, understands it the uh, other way, if it's good, that's good. It's got to be whatever is good in life is what you have to go by, not not the bad one. And right, whatever is right, and you're not supposed to be doing the wrong thing. But everything is strict. It's not. It's not like now. We see all these kids fighting and using drugs and all things, bad things going on, and yet nothing we can do about them. We tell them they don't know. That's right. They think it's right to be doing that. It's hard to make them understand. Now, I may be the only one telling you this. I um, probably am the only elderly telling you this because I've never heard any of the elderly talk about these things, which we should. We should tell them, but like I say, they wouldn't listen. Even if we do tell them, they wouldn't listen, but that's how it is. It's strict. It, the, the Indian, what the values they go by, it's strict, strictly. That's our, but that's our Indian way, when we have to go by it. Now they're trying to do some things uh, in Indian way, but I think it's too late to learn those things, huh? Cause at, in the beginning they didn't learn. Like, I hear some people buried somebody uh, on a scaffold. And that should have never been done, because nowadays they don't do that. But 
you know, doing things like that is, that's wrong. It can fall back on them and something could happen to them. And, and uh, that's why I say the Indian religion is very strict. You cannot play around with it. But uh, if once you learn how and respect it, it's a, something that's really strong. That's what I go by. I even talked to the spirit. Uh, my husband died in 1980, and I used to work with a medicine man, and he tells me a lot of things, and he, he teaches me how to. I also help him, you know, get his medicine too. He te tells me what plant, what kind of plant, and which plant. He, sh he shows me those plants. So I help him pick plants way out in country. And that's, I go in the ceremonies and, and that's what they tell me what, that it, a lot of people think Indian religion is not right. They think that's, the one was saying it's a devil, that's the devil's worshiping. But it's not, it's something that very strict and Indians have to use that a long time ago. They go by that, that's why they lived their right life. Each family knows about it too. And, but there are some people that are just like us now, don't listen, just go about not doing it right, but they use it. They, they even use Indian medicine men to to get at other people, you know. but that's not right to use it like that. So I worked with the land medicine man, and I go to ceremonies, and I talk with the spirit, and they tell me that they are, they once lived themselves one time, one of them told me he lived 100 years ago, he said, and at the time, he said, when I was living, he said, I'll help people when they're sick. He said, I'm not living anymore, but I still help people. So those are the people that were, were medicine men at one time, that they died, but their spirit lives on and helps people. So well, that's what, that's the way the Indian religion goes. So I take my kids to the ceremonies and I make them sit in there and but sometimes they get scared but they understand. It's easy to understand. But it's good to understand. If you know it, it's My husband talked to me after he died. He said, I was, I, was, I was crying, he said. He told me not to cry anymore. He said, he, he said, I'm still with you. He said, don't be crying. But he said, talk to me. When you're in need or problems or trouble, he said, just talk to me. I'll help you out, whatever I can, he said. Well, that's the way I believe in it. I think that's the way it goes. That's the way I understand. But it's not to be used the wrong way. Just use it right and they'll help you. They'll know you and they'll come to you and they'll look after you too. That's my pot right there, hanging right there. My son um, was into drinking. He was, he was still young, but he was, it seems like uh, he would have never stop. And you know, one day, one day he said, I'm going to, I plan on going to school, he said, so. And then he asked his older brother to, he said, can you stay with her and 
help her so I can go to school. He said, well, yeah, he said, go on. He said, I'll have to stay with her. So he did. He went to school. And he graduated from there, United Tribes in Bismarck. And then after he come back from there, he turned to Indian religion. He go to sweat, and he goes to those services, those ceremonies. And from then on, he, he just quit drinking. No not drink anymore. He's a policeman now, but he started working as about 10 years ago. He's still working and don't drink anymore, but he goes to those sweats and, and you know, wherever Indian ceremonies. And he said that really worked for him. He said he doesn't crave, like when he was going back to drinking, he said, I never think about it. He said, I'd rather stay away from it. And it's helping me. He said, it made me strong. So it is, it's powerful. He said, if you only believe in it, it's something that's really, it's hard to understand. It's hard to make anybody understand, but you have to go through it yourself to find out. There's a lot of things to it. I'm here by myself, but that's what made me strong. Well, how can Indian religion help someone who's grieving the loss of loved ones? Mm-hmm. I told him, I said, if you can only get to a ceremony and ask, that's what I did. I asked if I could talk to my husband, and he told me to make this much ties and bring it, and I did, and the food, and there it was, he was, they came. I couldn't believe it. But that was him, and I had um, uh, this medicine man, this Joey Tuna. He had a brother that was killed. And he came with him, and I talked to both of them. And, you know, he he showed me where he was hit and killed. He hit him on the head and bashed his head in. He made me touch his head, and so he made me feel where his head was bashed in. But there was a cloth that was covered like that. And the second time that I talked to him, his head was all back to normal. There was no, in, it wasn't in anymore. It was just back to normal. And he said, sometimes, he said, I'll come and talk to you again. Was, and he, he came, that time he came with my husband. And, but he believe, really believed in Indian religion. He always goes, we always go to a ceremony. And here, um, that's what happened. So we think they're gone, they're, when they're dead, they're gone. Not with us anymore, but that's not the way. Even if we want to tell them something, they're right there, they're right here. But there's just only one time I did that. But you know, it it takes a lot to go through that. You have to make your ties and the other stuff that goes in the ceremony. So when he's gonna have ceremony, he always comes after me, but lately I couldn't go any place. I'm too sickly to walk, can't walk around. I need, I need medicine, but I need to talk to him, but he, he's always gone, so I don't know where he could be now. He usually travels to Canada all over. He, he goes to Oklahoma, to Montana.
And so do you go to Sundance also? No, I didn't take part in that. I go to it, but I, my granddaughter's going to be in a Sundance, but if, wherever she's going on, I'd like to go, but I don't know if I can or not. My, my, my health is not good, and if I fix up, maybe I can go. I got a pinched nerve, and that's affecting my legs, my nerves, my legs. That's why I can't walk. It's something I can't, I can't get, get rid of. It's, there's pain there all the time. I need to get do something about it, but maybe someday I will. Before I get too sick. Well, maybe you could talk about some of the different birds and animals that are a part of this religion, the eagle and the buffalo, and and share the importance of that when we pray and do our ceremonies and mm -hmm. live our life. An eagle talked to me, too, in a ceremony. But I couldn't make out what he was saying. And they asked me if I wanted to interpret, interpret but uh, it was about over. So. I mean, it's the next time, and I never did get it in trouble. Well, Buffalo has been a great part of an Indian's life. Every part of the body is used one way or the other for their clothes, food, and, and tools and their shelter. The hide is used, some are used for shelter to make a teepee. That's what they lived in. And the bones are made into to tools to scrape the hide and, and to work the hide. That's mainly what they use. And the meat just prepared, mostly drying. It can be dried and kept for a long time. And, and the inside part is all eaten too because it can be eaten and dried. Even the urine bag is used to carry water and stuff in because that's a real strong bag that if it's cleaned out, you know, washed out and dried, it's to keep their food in there too. Even the hoops are made use of. How is it that they use the hooves? Well, those uh, hooves, inside those hooves are the, the bones. Uh, there's two or three small bones in there. The hooves, when they're cooked, they take out these little bones, and those are used for uh, toys for the kids, for the children. They call them bone horses. And. Some part, some part of the bone is used to make that one kind of a toy too. That it's on a long string that you, you and then you throw it up and then you. This one is a long one, long bone. That there's a, it's like made like a needle. So there's a hole at the bottom, and then there's these things are all made like a bead. So you throw it up and then you just try and catch as many as you can. That's made out of buffalo bones. And maybe you can tell about the horse and what the horse meant to the people. You know, I really don't know too much about the horse, but just when my grandfather, they have horses, and so I learned to 
I was helping him take them to water and 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 tie them or put them where they can eat. And, and well, you just have to understand the horse to how, how gentle it is. Some are not. Some are so gentle that you can just. One was so gentle that it stepped on my foot and <laughs> I couldn't make it move because it didn't want to move. It hurt my feet. But we ride, we ride horses and go all over. We go pick berries and we ride horses or go in the wagon. It takes a lot of work to get those horses trained so you can use them like that. Takes years and years time to take time to get them where you want them to be, like, gentle enough to make them do all the work in the garden, like in the garden, or to go after water or wood. They have to learn how to learn how to stomp and go and. How about the dog? Because the dog used to be do what the horses do. Oh yes. Well, dog. We had a. My mother-in-law had a dog in here. That dog. She he the dog can. Um, whatever she says, he, the dog knows. Whatever she tells the dog, she she he the dog knows the language, and just but you can just talk to the dog and. We'll go get this or do this, and you go do it. He'll either bring wood to her too, for a fire, for her fire, or you know things like that. It's a big help too. And they watch when something's in danger, or they know, they let you know. And they help take care of your. Like if you have chickens, they help take care of the chicken. Or if you have any other kind of animals, they, they help watch too. If you have one for a long time, that's how they are there. They help in the family too. And if you talk to them, they'll understand, they'll know. But they, and then, or she said if they want to, if she wanted to erase it, but she should have said she should erase it. But then she said she was going to do it. So they were after her, keep coming in her dream, but she still didn't do it. Now I'm scared for her, but I don't know why. She said that she should have just erased it, and I know that. Um, my grandmother had a dog too, <clears throat> and she always had puppies. So she she always raised those puppies. She feeds them good and gets them pot, and then they eat them. And they even eat, use them in ceremonies too. But they're, they're good to eat, so they it's more like a food to, for them for too. Maybe that's why we're called dog eaters. <laughs> people, some people. Uh, Chippewa Indians were saying that that that's what the, the Sioux Indians are called, the dog eaters. Well, they're called um, something about rabbit, rabbit chokers or something like that. They're called that too. <laughs> they catch a rabbit and somehow they choke them, so that's why they're called rabbit chokers. So when you you were young, did they have different foods, like the rabbit? Mm-hmm. Rabbit share was. some of the different kinds of game that they got when they couldn't always get deer. Well, they um, they always get rabbits, and cotton tail rabbits, and prairie chicken, and um, badgers, and but badgers are not supposed to be eaten. A woman that is nursing is not supposed to eat badger meat. So that has always been told to the women folks. Cannot, it's a, it, 
makes your um, milk stop coming. <clears throat> so you're not supposed to eat that badger meat. I don't know how true it is, but they said it's true that they don't have milk if they don't have to either eat a badger meat. But the lemon skunk is used for medicine. That's a really smelly thing, but um, it's used for medicine. The, the fat is used for medicine. They melt, they kill them, and then they get the fat out, and then they, they um, put them in a bread pan oven, and they let it um, kind of roast it like in, in the oven for a while. And then they, when it's all melted, and they put that in a can or something, and they use that grease for, for cough, cough and different things. Sore throat, it's mostly for cough and sore throat, and for cold, when you have cold, then make you drink that. It doesn't taste bad. <laughs> One of them animals is always tells us that the beaver is um, considered, I don't know how you would call it, but in Lakota way you call it wakan, it's holy. You cannot jump over their blood. Their blood is so strong they said it can cause a miscarriage. And when a woman is pregnant, you're not even supposed to go near a beaver. That it can cause a miscarriage and lose a baby. So they're always, when they kill one, you have to plug the nose so that no blood comes out. Then, when, as you're skinning it, you cannot even drop a blood in any place. It's, it's that's how strong it must be. I know my dad was really strict about that, so he traps them and he always skins them, but he always makes us stay away. Never to go near it or jump over it or nothing. Does the beaver have medicine in it then that's good? I don't know what it is, but that, that's about all, all I know about beaver, that uh, we were always warned to stay away when, when they kill one. Really good. I don't know if this is jumping too far, but maybe you could speak about um, when you're through speaking about the animals, you could speak about how the people demonstrated respect and honor within their family and within their community. Mm -hmm. Okay. <clears throat> the main thing that the Lakota people go by is to have respect for each other is is the wotakuya, the relation, the relatives, the, your relatives, and I think every Indian is related to every Indian because that's what holds the respect for each one. So then, that's why they are together as a tioshpa. But they said, my grandfather said, when one does something wrong in a tioshpa or in a community. He is asked to stay away, move out and stay away until he straightened himself out. Then he can come back into the church wagon. So I guess that's what they do. But that that's not that don't happen very often because just just very few of them like might commit a crime or something. And but they, but they cannot do that to each other because that's like like your sisters and your brothers. You cannot call them by their first name. You have to say there's a older brother and younger brother, younger sister and older sister. You have to call them by that. 
I didn't even know my grandmother's and grandfather's names until I was, you know, growing up, because we never did call their names, or even my uncles. I never did know my uncles' names until I was older. Then I got to know them way afterwards. That's when one of them died, and that was my uncle that died. And I didn't even know his first name because I I have to call him uncle all the time in Mindel. And that's what the way they lived a long time ago. Because when, when I lived, when we lived with my grandmother in Cherkut, nobody calls each other by their names. It's always the way you're related to that person. person. And that's what holds the respect. You cannot talk to your son-in-law, or you cannot talk to your brothers, because you cannot even joke around with your brothers. You have to, if whatever you're going to tell them, you have to say, like you're saying, brother, and then talk to them. You cannot call their name and just joke around with your brothers. And that, that's the way they do it. Even your father-in-law. I have three son-in-laws. I never talk to them. They never talk to me, unless if they really have to. I have three son-in-laws. I never talk to them. They never talk to me, unless if they really have to. <clears throat> but that um, I live my Indian way, so I still go by those. Yeah. You can not talk to your son-in-law, joke around. Even your daughter-in-law, you cannot do that. Or you can't go in front of them. Your brothers and if your brother have brothers, you cannot go in front of them. When you do, you have to hold your dress down or cool. You cannot, because you're a woman, you have to really watch yourself. You cannot show your legs. And you cannot go in front of men. You cannot jump over kids' clothes because you can get them sick. And I always tell this to, to girls, but they don't like to hear. This woman had a dream. A woman, an Indian woman had a dream. And here, in her dream, I guess she said she was going someplace. And here she was dragging all the babies that she she miscarried, she was somehow they were all in a row in a cord, all tied from one to each other's navel, and I guess she was dragging them like that. So when you miscarried, that's how you are after you die. I guess she said that's what she said. So um, that's what I was telling the girls. I said. If you can't help it, I said, don't do that. Because I said, when you, if you die, you pull your babies around like that. Drag your babies around. That one woman screamed and she said, you should have never told me because I had four miscarriages. She said, oh, I didn't know you did that. I said, well, this is something that I have to tell the girls. I said, so they won't be doing that. Those are, that's, it's just that's a lot of respect, you know, goes down the line, a lot of ways. That's why, that's why the Indian people all live together, but probably got along good way back then because of the the relationship or the, the relatives and how each one is treated and treat the way they treat each other. Nowadays they don't do that, so they come in any time and fight you and quarrel with you and say bad things to you, but that's not the Indian way. So actually, Indian life is way different from from the way we're living now. 
we are more towards the white people's way. Like if you draw a line, we're mostly on the white people's side. We're not Indians anymore because we are more towards the white people's way and we are not using the Indians' way of life. So we're doing away with our Indian life and we are more towards the white people's way. That's why we lost our language now. Everything we're losing. But they're, nowadays they're trying to bring back some of the things, but I don't know how it worked. There was a, one boy that said he went to, uh, oh, what do you call that now? Sweat, oh, um, Hambalacha. He says he just got done. That's one of my, my own nephews. But he's part white. And they say it doesn't seem right that he's doing it. And all those people from this end are all white people, mostly white people, like they're part Indian, but then mostly all white. But they're all going into Indian dancing now. And I don't know what's happening, but maybe we're all turning back to Indian, I said, which is good. I like to see that, but I know it's going to be hard. I don't like it when they say Indian religion is devil's work. I don't like to hear that. I don't like to hear people say that. I heard this one woman say that, and I said, don't say that for Indians. I said, we, if you don't know nothing about it, don't say anything. Even saying that the cow pipe is belongs to is belong to the devil, she was saying. Well nobody knows how those happened. Those happened a long time ago, way before all of us ever existed. Nobody knows how it's but it's it's something that we have to learn how to honor and use. My mother-in-law is from that family, and she tells us about it, so. But my husband was in the Army, and he... For a while, he couldn't make himself believe in it and, and use it the way his mother wanted him to because he's from that family. But he said, well, we, we said, we, we're supposed to go by that Bible now, he said, and I made myself believe in the Bible, he said, and, and, and there you said, you can't have two masters, so I believe in that Bible, he said, and he said, and he or she said, son, I want you to go over there with me, and, and I want you to touch that pipe, she said, because you are back home safely, she said. And I was in World War II. She, he was in there four years. And he, he came back in here. That's what she said in here. He said, no, she said, I made myself believe in the Bible, so. And here later on, she changed. He went back, he went over there, and he prayed there. And that, that was this pipe there and that thing there. So after he died, I just kept it. And, and that pipe was found way out in, out in a country where there was nobody ever lived around the place. The place it was found out in the country, probably from owned by some Indians a long time ago. And the stem rotted, rotted away, but the pipe was still there. My brother found it and he gave it to my, my husband. So. He had a blessing. He said, ever since it must belong to some old body way back. No, I don't know what else to tell you. Is there anything you'd like to share about the story of how the pipe came to the people since your Sands Ark? 
came to your people? Mm. Well, my mother-in-law's from that family. Her father is the one that used to be the main keeper, Alkid. This is his name. And she knew, she, they were the, I guess it was given to that family. Now they're saying it's 19 generation back. And so it's been handed down from generation to generation and and there's a lot of things with it that she said that um, you ha whenever you go near it, you're supposed to take an offering for a woman, a material, like this dress material, but two or three yards. She said you're supposed to take it to the, the pipe for offering, and you're not supposed to talk about it which I'm doing now, which, but I hope that everything's okay. That, uh, that she said that snakes come around when you talk about it, so they're not supposed to talk about it. And it's just, just the way the story goes, they always tell about brought by a, by a woman. We couldn't, I couldn't make myself understand just how it goes, but my husband never did want to talk about it. So my mother-in-law is from that Sioux Indian. Well, maybe instead of talk, we don't need to tell that story or talk about that pipe, but maybe you'd like to talk about the family itself mm -hmm. what, and what their life was like. Would that be all right when we turn the camera back on? Okay. Well, they lived in, they're from Greengrass, and they lived there. And my mother was from there. Her name was Bessie, and she's an Alcott woman. And she's a sister to um, Eli's Alcott, who's a keeper of the pipe. And in one, one of his sisters, well, I don't know how the relation goes, but name Marcel Badwer kept the pipe after the um, Alcad man died, and she passed it on to Stanley, looking horses' um, son. That that. They said they made a mistake, but it should have been um, one named Moses Badmail should be the one to keep the pipe, but they made a mistake and let, they let that woman keep the pipe. And she married a man from Standing Rock, so the pipe was taken care of by that family, which is from the families from the Standing Rock. But it stayed here on a reservation. And as we hear, we don't know if it's true or not, that at one time it was stolen by some people, but was brought back. And it's been here ever since. Maybe you could share what kind of responsibilities a family has when they take care of a sacred possession such as that. I don't know just what to do. Um, all the time that we went down there, we never see them going to sweats way before, but um, I don't know, before Stanley died, they were starting to have those sweats down there. And people go down there, they come from all over. 
and they have a prayer there. One time we went there for, they brought the pipe out and they were having a prayer there, so we went over there. There was a whole bunch of people from Pine Ridge and all over came. And here a horse joined the service, which was something really, I really got scared. That horse came running in and and he stood just so far from that pipe and his that mane uh, looks like the, the all the hair was just up and the tail was up. It looks like it was scared but I don't know what why that happened like that. That the horse was just just going around like this and then pretty soon it just stopped stand still. So, um Arvo went over there and he kind of pushed the horse around. We should have left it. They said he should have left it there because he was, that horse was there to be in the service or something. Or maybe that horse, maybe the thunder made him do that or something, but he pushed him away so it, it took off and just went over. It knew where it came from, so it just went back down that road. That was really scary thing. <laughs> Oh, we didn't, I didn't know what to do. We didn't know what that, why that happened like that. Or that, why that horse did that. But that horse really knows it too. So, they have sweats and that's, and then they, they have those, um, I know a lot of people go there to have uh, those vision quests up on that hill. They do that there too. And that's where they gathered for that too. I went to a sweat over there too. We were doing her. We were doing that, so we, my husband and I we went to the sweat, but there was no medicine man there. So nothing really happened, you know, it's just going in there and come out. I went to another sweat, and here there was a medicine man there. And here, the spirits were in there. The spirits came in, and they even talked to us in the sweat. And that was really something. My son was killed in a car accident, and and he he was seen after he was buried. He was seen sitting where he was killed. And his um, one of his nieces saw him, and she came and told me that she should tell the medicine man why, why he's doing that. There must be a reason why he's doing that, showing himself after he died. And so we made a ceremony with a different medicine man from Rapid City, and he when we took us to a sweat, so we went through the sweat, and here they brought him. The spirit brought him in here. He saw me and he started crying. He said he couldn't leave me. He said I was so uh, crying for him too much that he couldn't go where he was supposed to go. That's why he said he's still around. So if I don't, if I stop doing that, he said, he'll go on. And the spirit said, they, they'll take him if, if I say I will stop doing that. So I was crying for him, because he was the only one that stayed with me when he got killed in a car accident. So that's why he was, he didn't want to leave me. So that's why his spirit was still with me all the time, and that's why he showed himself. After that, never did show himself. And in my dream, he told me he was happy, that I, I helped him along, and that I wasn't crying for him like I was. But that was something that oh, I just made it, barely made it through. And it's so hard to go. My son, he was the only one that helped me, and stayed with me in here, he got killed all of a sudden.
What are the grieving traditions that they practiced? Mm, well, first it's the four days. Four days that you have to. You know, they, they say that the, the spirit stays four days and go on. So you have for well, the first four days, you have to. Well, you know, in a white man's way, now they're doing because the undertaker takes the body, and in four days they bring them and they bear them. Well, in that four days, you're supposed to stay home and do your homework, work around the house, and, and just keep busy working, cleaning your house and washing and do everything that you're supposed to be doing and not get mad because there's a that that um, there's something about it that is strong during that time. They call it wo aya. So whatever, if you go traveling on those days, you'll be you want to go traveling every day, and that's going to stay with you for a while. So that's why they always tell us to stay home and and be good to each other and don't get mad at nobody and you have to really control your temper and and ways you have to get along with everybody and that way everything will go smooth for you during that time. So that's one of the Indian ways that we have to do. Even to this day, the ones that know about it, they do that. At first they well, long time ago, they usually they cut themselves up on the legs with a knife. They um, torture themselves. They cut their hair, and they wear black clothes. But nowadays, they don't do that. Do you know anyone who kept the spirit of their loved one, the keeping of the spirit ceremony and the releasing of the spirit ceremony? No, I never did know that one. Well, the medicine man told me that. My sister's son died in here. Every non, whoever lives in that house was always uh, hearing noise in the house and um, and here, that medicine man said that his spirit was bounded in there. It has to be released, but that takes a ceremony. You have to make black ties, and you have to, they're going to leave that spirit out so it can go. But you never did. Was, um, one family lived there and got scared out and finally moved out because he was always in in a room and walking around and late at night. But they didn't do that with that, that ceremony. But then they have the memorial the end of the year. Mm hmm I don't think they did any memorial for thing for any for any of those that time, which they should have, but I don't know what made them not to do anything for them. I did that for my son. Uh, one year later, I did this memorial thing for him, and I had it done. And I was relieved because it looks like it's a pressure. As long as I didn't do it, and I was hanging over my head all the time. I had to get ready and get it done. So what different kinds of things did you do for the memorial? Uh, um, prayer was the first thing. Um, I had the medicine man come and, and do the prayer for him. He sang a song and then an eagle came and 
was was right above in the where we were, and that chair was something. Even some white people came, so they saw it and they were really glad to see it. But um, after that, we had our meal and our giveaway. We got it done, and I felt so good after that. So that's what. I like to give this message to the to the parents of the the children, boys and girls. I wish the parents would teach their kids some of the the Koto ways, especially how to keep and respect and learn the Indian culture because we are Indians. We cannot be we cannot be white people. Our ways are different. Our Indian ways are different and we should teach our kids some of the ways. There is lots to learn but try and teach your children some of the Indian ways because then we can say we are Indians. We can we can't forget some other things that we live by. Especially those the values which I can't remember two of them but they're important bravery and be brave enough to send your kids to school and be brave enough to take care of your kids. Be brave enough to take care of your kids so that you be, and know where they are and what they're doing so that they won't, wouldn't be the way they are now. Drinking and drugs is not the Indian way. Indians never have those things. They like to have a clear mind, a strong mind, to live a straight life and think right. Young mothers, take care of your kids. Don't leave them behind. Because the Lakota they say that the children are wakam. If you treat them wrong, you, the mother, will suffer the same. If you are a woman, Learn how to respect your children, your family, especially your brothers and the and the, and your um, all the rest of your family. Well, thank you for. I hope that you can understand me because I'm not a very good English talker, but I'm trying my best. Yes, that's very good. Would you like to give some messages to the little children? Okay. This is a message to the little children. 
obey your parents and learn how to do the right thing and try and grow upright so that someday you will be a, might be a leader in Lakota. Community. That is okay. Cheyenne Indians are from Montana, and that's their uh, tribe name. And. They live in Montana. In Lakota, they are called Shahila. This we don't know what it Shahila means, but that's the tribe's name in Indian. The word Cheyenne is used wrong when talking about Cheyenne River. It is not Shahila Wakpa. It is the real name is Wakpa Washte, meaning good river, flows into Minnesota, Missouri River. And this one Lakota teacher here in the Gobut School told his students that Cheyenne. means, um, oh, he used that Cheyenne, or he says Shahila Wakpa, which is not right. It's supposed to be Wakpa Washte. For a Lakota way, that's the way the Lakotas call it, the Cheyenne River is called Wakpa Washte. But he told them that it was Shahila Wakpa, and he uses that Indian tribe name there, but that's not right. I met some students from uh, France. They came, they were exchange students, and they they came to visit around, and they came down to my place in Thunder Butte. And so I visited with them, and I don't know what made me say that, but I asked them, do you know, is Cheyenne a French word? I said, because they said, yes, it's a French word. And so I said, what does it mean? And here, they said, it means dog. So that that's what they told me it means. And su or nada we su, he said, it means snake. But that's what we are called. For short, we are called su. After that, I, I, tell, I always tell her, I even told a council man that should change our name. I said, snake, we are called, probably called snake people. But they never did nothing about it, so we still go by that Cheyenne or Cheyenne River Sioux. I guess at one time these French peoples were all over in this reservation, and that's how come we have a lot of people on this reservation that go have French names like Douchenos, Traverses, Dupree. Those are all French names, they tell me. Lacombs and some others. Brewers. Those are all French names, so I'd like to get that straightened out with the students if possible. Because because once you teach a student something, they remember it that way. So we don't want them to know Sharon River as Shahila Wakba, but Wakbashte. And this reservation, in this reservation, we have six districts. The first one on the west end is Bridger, and it is called Hakini, which means survivors. They are the survivors from the Wounded Knee Battle. I guess they came back there and they lived there since 
So they are called Hagini or survivors. But Bridger is their community name. Red scaffold is Wichaganagapisha. That means a red scaffold. Cherry Creek is Chumpawakpa. That means Cherry Creek. Bear Creek is Mount Hoakpa Oyanke. Green grass is Peji Hoakpa Oyanke. On the trees is named after Ed on the trees. He is a man that used to live there. So he is named after that man. The community is named after that man on the trees. And another name they go by is Sands Ark or Itazipcho Oyanke. The, that's where the Sands Ark people, that band of Indians were brought back from Canada and they camped there until they were given lands. After they were given lands, they all moved out to their own lands and made their homes. White Horse is named after a man too. His name is White Horse. And Promise, named after a man too. His name was to be John Promise. And Blackfeet community is named after a man too, but that we don't know. Swift Bird is named after a man. His name was Swift Bird. And Dupree is a town in the middle of the reservation. And we call it Matkoakpa Otungahe. That means Bear Creek Town. That's the way the Lakota people call it. Matkoakpa Otungahe. That creek that runs by the by the town is Kawakpawash. Or Matkoash Matkoakpa Otungahe. They said bears used to live along that that creek, that's why it's called Bear Creek. And Faith is a town west of Dupree. It's outside the Indian reservation, but Indians always go there for their shopping. That's there. Some of them have their post office there, and, and it's called Wahimpaha Otungahe. Behind, but north of but so many miles from Pace, there is a butte that's called Flint Rock Butte. And so that is named after, the Lakotas named it after Wahimpa. That's a, a Flint Rock Butte. It's right north of Pace. I was wondering about that butte because I wonder why they call it Flint Rock Butte. Maybe the Indians used to make their flints out of that or what? I like, I never did read the story or hear anything about it. And Isabel is a town towards north. And that's called Yashija Otumahe, because those people that lived in that town are Russian people. And you know how the Russian people talk when, in their own language? That's the way the Lakota people call them Yashija, because they don't understand them, that's why they always call them that. Some German people, they all have their own, talk in their own language, and they dress in their own ways, and they live their own ways, so they do, you know, with their own country. So they wear long dresses and big tall hats, and, and every Sunday we used to see them like that. And they talk their own language. And Red Elm is a little station between Dupree and Faith. And that is called Chang Yihanke Otungahe. That's where the Bear Creek ends. That's why they call it Chang Yihanke. Timberlake is a town in the northern, northern part of the reservation. It's called Belechan Otungahe. And Eagle Butte here is Wambali Paha Otungahe. Wambali Paha. There's a hill south of here 
south of town here where the Indians used to catch eagles for their feathers. They made, a, they, they said they make a hole so many feet down and they catch a rabbit and they, and they put it on top. They make it so that you, the eagle will see the rabbit. And when the eagle comes, they come to pick up the rabbit and the eagle is caught. So that's the way they catch the eagles. They said. And this, these eagles are kept alive in the home. And whenever they shed their feathers, they said that's the way they get their feathers. And that's, that's about all on our community. Long time ago, I guess other Indian life, the real Indian way of life was different, very different from the way we are now. The real Indian life is altogether different. They have different ways doing their, when especially as the burials and marriages are all done differently, which some we don't know, we don't hear about them. Me, I was young when my grandparents were with me and some I didn't ask about. But I ask, whatever I ask about, I remember. But how they lived and a long time ago and I asked my grandmother how she kept keeps her baby when they were small because I was wondering about diapers and stuff, and then I ask her, "How do you, what do you use for, for blankets or diapers?" She said that they, they use cattail. They take it apart and then they put it into their cradle, and when it soaked up, she said they empty it out and then they put a clean one in there. But that's how they keep their babies. She said she told me that. I should have asked a lot of questions, but I never, I just asked a few questions and and then I asked about people when they die. Where is it that they, so many things that have to be done and they keep telling us that we have to know them. They want us to know everything about it so that we can tell our kids. So when a family dies, member dies, they said that the spirit still stays with them for four days. So during that time, the family have to be quiet, although they're crying, they are to be quiet and not be hollering or courting or arguing over anything, but must be quiet and quietly do the homework around their house and stay home because if they travel all the time, that's the way they're going to be doing all the time. There's something, it's more like, um, I don't know how you, they would describe that, but it's something that, it's like a habit forming. What you do will stay with you, keep doing it over and over every day. And so um, my grandmother and grandfather used to tell us when a family member died, we have to, you have to be, Staying home, not be naughty, and do housework, clean up, try to be neat, 
You're not supposed to scratch yourself. And you're not supposed to be eating and stay home. If you don't do that and if you travel during that time all the time, that's what you're going to be doing for, I don't know, for length of time that during the time that your, your dead person is there, the body is there, they have to stay home or else if they're traveling in those days, that's all they're going to be doing is traveling, going someplace every day. And that's so true. I've seen it happen. And it's so true that it's, it's like that. And we all, always tell my, my children about that. But as they grow up, this white man's way is stronger now. People don't go by those things anymore, but it's still with us. It's, we're Indians, so we're, it's still with us. We don't know it, but... And during the time that four days try and do everything quietly and nicely and be good to each other, and have respect for each other. And when the funeral is over, they have one year to mourn. A long time ago, they used to cut their hair and wear black clothes during their mourning. And they have to wear those for one year. Some even cut their legs and torture themselves because they were so close, the families were so close then that they do that. And the older people especially, they mourn for their loved ones and they do those things. And then during the one year, they get ready for a, for a memorial. When, the, when they get to the day that the person died in one year, they make a feast and they have their giveaway in memory of the person. And that's when they take off their black clothes and they braid their hair and they can go back to the way they used to be before that happened. They can now go back to dancing and singing and to the good times. Before then, after, after the funeral, they cannot go to no dances or sing. They have to keep away from all that. But nowadays, it's different. They take drum in there and they sing in there, which is not right, but that's what they do. You know, I went to a workshop here at the cultural center about traditional things, and they asked some questions here, which oh, there, there's a lot of them. We don't know. Some we don't know, some we never hear about. And I don't know who made these questions, but those are, there's some that probably know, but it says, why is a pipe sacred? And that's something that nobody couldn't answer. They don't know. And but it, it seems like they could tell us wh why these questions are asked, but they never did tell us the answers. They just gave us these questions to answer. And there are some bur burial things that were asked too, but some of them we never hear about. Maybe they used to live like that, maybe different tribes how are the people positioned for burial? Now those we don't know. 
and what was put with them when man and woman were man and woman buried in the same manner? What were the differences? You now those things are a real hard questions. And but we well, our amulets like turtle lizard figures use sacred. I don't think they are t are I don't think they are sacred, but they are used. They keep them, like they hang them on the wall, like they say the turtle has a long life and is slow and is smart. That's why they use that. They keep make them beat it and they keep them in their home. Each one probably carries one in the bag just for the long life and for the Way the turtle is that they just, you know, I don't know what you how you would call that, but that's what they do. That's what I've seen. I've seen that because they were bearded turtles and something like little lizards. But I don't know they were called differently. But um, they were used to carry them. They bearded one for me to carry around. Saying that. That's what they told me that. They, they um, like to have their ways, you know. The turtle has a long life. And that's why they carry them. They even make turtles and then they put the babies up. Um, navel, when the navel, what do you, what do you call that, come, comes off, they put it, put it in there. They want the baby to have a long life. That's why they they do that. And these ceremonies, there's a lot of ceremonies that people go through that way back then. Some we don't even hear about about the young girls having beaded balls and and why. I never, I never heard about those. And asking about begging sticks stuff. I never hear about it. But then, in a way, um, when we were living in Cherokee, they had a celebration there, and people come. They put sticks in front of the house all down the line. They, they name somebody and then they put a stick there. And I think that's what it is, that begging stick. They ask them to donate something, food or whatever they can. And when they get that stick, they have to donate something. And there must be one called end stick too, but I and a fluid Fruit is sacred or not? We don't know those. We don't never hear about those. Actually, <laughs> our Indian life is very different from what what we live. We're more in, more into white man's way than being Indian because we lost our language now. Nobody talks to Lakota language anymore. Maybe I'm the only one that speaks the language. I'm trying to teach them back to the kids, but it's hard. They tried, but the English is strong. It's hard to teach them. And then they go back and they talk. The mothers and fathers all talk English, so the kids don't talk the Lakota language anymore. No, they don't want to do any of the Lakota ways. No, they don't even have respect for each other. They um. They don't even know who they're related to. They, that's why they have no respect for each other. They lost their, who they are related to. They don't know who they are related to, and it's the mother's fault that they lost that. I 
I have a bunch of grandchildren, but they all know me as a grandma. And grandpa, their grandpa died. And, but they all know him as grandma and grandpa. But they never say uncle or auntie to their uncles or aunties, their brothers and sisters. But it's their mother's fault, it's your fault that you didn't teach your kids with. Like when, when, when I was small, that's the first thing I had to learn was to know who is my uncle, to know who is my father and grandfather, grandmother, all those uncles, cousins. I had to know all those before. stories behind some of those names that you gave us earlier, the um, the bands of people who live here on this reservation? Are there any stories about how they got their names? I just hear about that um, one um, that I'm from, I'm from that Sands Art Band, mm -hmm. and they were um, band of Indians. They were, I guess, right from, right after Custer battle there, they went into Canada, and they they lived up there for a while until the U.S. Army went after them and brought them back. And they're the ones that lived in the honor tree community right down here by Greengrass. And they moved to the to the lands that were given to them after they moved back. That's a Sanzark, a Dazipcho, they call him. Dazipcho is, a, is a, I guess he was a man that was out hunting and he was caught without a bow and arrow. So that's why he, they call him a Dazipcho, that's without bow and arrow. And two cattle is another one. They said this this man was butchering a buffalo, and this other these other people went there and they asked for enough to cook two times. And here. Um,